The question is, is zero limit point of D And what you note is that if you take 1 over n for n larger than 2, then, so let's call it an, then an belongs to d for all n bigger than 2. And an converges to 0. So 0 is a limit point. It's enough to find one sequence that converges to the point in question and which is in your set to show that you have a limit point. Now for B, uh, 2 of course is not a limit point. It's uh, too far away. Uh, in order to be a limit point, you either need to be in the set or a boundary point of your set. Okay, that's, uh, what the general rule is. Uh, so 2 is not, and you can do the following. You can say, well, take any bn in D uh, such that bn converges to L. Okay, So you take a convergent sequence in D that converges to some L. You don't know where L is. And then you say the following, well, but my bn is strictly between 0 and 1. 0 converges to 0. 1 converges to 1. Uh, the inequalities become large. These are all consequence of operation sum limits. And this gives you that your L is between 0 and 1. But now it could be 0 and, or 1. But certainly it cannot be 2. OK? So L is never 2. which means that 2 cannot be a limit point. OK, you see what the reasoning is? If it were a limit point, then it, uh, it, we, I would have a sequence converging to it, which is in D. Here I show that any sequence converging, which is in D, converges inside 0, 1 closed. Therefore, it cannot converge to Number two, so the question is, do I have a limit at minus 1? And so my function is f of x equal x cubed minus 1 over x plus 1, where x different from minus 1, and f of minus 1 equal to c. Intuitively, uh, when I am looking for a limit, I, I look at the function, what's going on when x approaches minus 1. Well, the numerator approaches minus 2, and this approaches 0. So you get minus 2 over 0, that's not going to be bounded. There is going to be no limit. That's very different, of course, than the situation where we have 0 over 0. When you get 0 over 0, you don't know what's going to happen. Okay? But here you do. Here you know there is, good, there is no limit for this thing. So how are we going to prove that? Well, let's take a sequence that approaches minus 1 and show that f of the sequence is not bounded and therefore cannot converge and the limit does not exist. Okay, So maybe we should just So remember what we the definition of limit of f of x is equal to as x approaches a is equal to l. The definition of that is what? Well, for every sequence x n that approaches a and which is different from a, we must have. f of xn approaching L. That's what our definition is. Okay, we go back to sequences, and we look at the image of sequences, and we must approach L. 
So in order to show that you don't have a limit, what do you do? You have two strategies usually. Either, in a case like that, where your function becomes unbounded near the point, you show that for a certain sequence xn, f of xn is not bounded, and therefore does not converge, and you are done. Or, if you are in the case where uh, you fluctuate around your point, you, what you show is that you have two sequences, xn and yn, that gives you two different limits. Okay, so these are the two methods to use to show that you don't have a limit. So here, let's pick a simple sequence that approaches minus 1, and which is not equal to minus 1. And then let's compute what this thing is. This becomes uh, so this is really n times uh, minus one plus one over n to the cube minus one. Okay. So the so this thing goes to minus two as the n goes to infinity, and this is unbounded. Uh, so you can uh, you can work a little harder. To, to show that uh, you, you're going to get something unbounded. I'm not sure how much uh, more work you want to put. But one, once you get to this point, you are basically done. Because this thing behaves like minus 2, this like n. You have essentially minus 2n. This is unbounded, and it's not going to converge. So you could stop here. Uh, if you want to be a little bit more precise, you could say, well, 1 over n goes to 0. So this thing is going to be. Uh, it's going to be less than 3 half, let's say, for n large enough. So my sequence here is going to be less than minus 3 half times n, which goes to minus infinity. And therefore, that, that's a little bit more rigorous. Okay? So, but in any case, you have something which is bounded here, something which is unbounded, uh, bounded and not going to zero, of course, because if you if you had something going to zero here, you do, you would need to do more work. You don't know what happens to infinity times zero, but here you do know what happens. So, in uh, summary, what you are going to do is say, well, uh, the whole thing f minus one plus one over n cannot be bounded. Therefore, it doesn't converge. And so it, uh, the limit uh, f has no limit at minus 1. The second part of uh, the second part of uh, the the problem is, can I pick C so that f is continuous at minus 1? The answer, of course, is no. I cannot. I cannot because of the following property. We say that the function f is continuous at minus 1 if and only if limit of f of x at minus 1 exists and is equal to uh, f of minus 1. Right? 
So because the limit does not exist, the function cannot be continuous. Whatever value you pick for your f of minus 1, it's never going to work. <coughs> Questions on this? OK, number five. In order to make appear uh, the definition of differentiability, you do this little manipulation to get two terms. This term, by definition, converges to f prime of a as h goes to 0. Now, what about this term? Well, we need to think a little bit, but it's not that difficult. Let's take Hn converging to 0, and always different from 0. Then let's do f of a minus f of a minus Hn over Hn. Now let's do the change of uh, sequence. Let's say Kn is minus hn. Let's define kn like this. kn goes to 0 as n goes to infinity by operations on limits. Minus 0 is 0. And kn is always different from 0. And when I plug it here, I get f of a minus f of a plus kn over minus kn. That's f of a plus kn minus f of a over kn. <coughs> this converges to what? f prime of a. So you see that this term here must converge to f prime of a as well. And that's how we get our 2 f prime of a. Yes. Why can't we um, why can't we just substitute something else in for a? And then, hmm. No, it, that's not like a good this idea. Be a way to do it, you know? But that's what I did. Well, a better way, you mean? Uh, yeah, a better, simpler way. No. Uh, yeah. Well, well, what you can do. And that's something I should have written. Um, what you can do is say, is prove that f is differentiable at a, if and only if f of x minus f of a over x minus a converges to f prime or to some limit, converges, I would say. Uh, as x approaches a. Okay, that's uh, yeah. equivalent to our definition, we, without the h, so that we don't know if it's a plus h or minus h, or you know, we get rid of the problem by doing that. <coughs> then uh, it follows from this version that when you are doing f of a minus h minus f of a over minus h, it should converge to the same limit as well. So yeah, there, there are several ways to look at that. Uh, I like this way because it's very precise. 
and we are really using our definition of uh, the, the, the original definition we get. But, you know, it's... But the big issue here is not to be mixed up with the signs. I mean, that's, that's the only thing, really, because you, you do see what's going on. And, but in order not to, to be mixed up, you just do, well, I go from A to A minus H here, so that's what I need to do here. I need to have A minus A minus H. And A minus A minus, so A minus A minus H is H. Okay, that's the only issue. Do, yeah. do I have a minus F prime or a plus F prime? Yeah, I just like the more general uh, definition. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that was five. Six. <laughs> so the problem is really this eraser. I'm sorry. But the, the, this one is, uh, is the one, so I'm going to throw it out. It's, it's old anyway has done all it could for us. So, uh, we have that f of 0 is 0, and that f is differential at 0, so we know that f of 0 plus h minus f of 0 over h converges to f prime of 0, as h goes to 0. But when we look at this thing and we use that uh, uh, f of 0 is 0, we end up with f of h over h. So that answers a, right? That's exactly, uh, we can call it f of x over x if we want, but it's exactly the same thing as this. For the second question, we want f of x squared over x. And this time we will write f of x squared over x squared times x. <coughs> we write this, of course, because we know what the limit is as x goes to 0. Okay, this goes to f prime of 0. And again, I could do what I did here, just to change. And we would you know, do substitution of sequences and show that we indeed get f of h over h. Okay. You don't seem to like that. Now, do you have questions? What? Is, it, is it clear that f of x squared over x squared goes to the same limit as f of x over x? That's because x goes to 0 if and, if and only if x squared goes to 0. So, and this goes to 0. Okay? Because we are doing the limit as x is going to 0. Okay? That's, that's why. So we get f prime of 0 times 0, which is 0. That's our limit as x goes to 0. Now, if we see uh, f of x over x squared, is f of x over x times 1 over x. This has a limit to f prime of 0. But this part is unbounded as x approaches 0. Okay. However, what's the problem with this? Zero times, zero. zero times infinity. What happens if my f prime of zero is zero? 
Okay, so uh, there is a mistake here. We should say that uh, has no limit if f prime of zero is different from zero. Otherwise, it may have a limit. I hope you all notice that. Is that because that's an indeterminate form? Yeah. So, but uh, let's okay. So let's assume for the time being that this is different from zero. So it's different from zero times unbounded. It's going to be unbounded. Okay. Now, what if f prime of zero is zero? Can I have a limit? Well, let's try. Uh, let's try. So what? Uh, okay. Let's let's try the simplest one. Would be f of x equal x squared. Then we we would have f prime of zero equal to zero. Uh, what happens to f of x over x squared? Well, it's one, so it converges to one. So it does have a limit in a case like that. Okay. That's it. Oh, seven. Oh, okay. Seven. Okay. So we are assuming that f of x is less than cx squared. Um, so one thing that we can see is that f of 0, when you plug in 0 in this inequality, is going to be 0. And therefore, when we do f of x or f of, let's use h, f of 0 plus h minus f of 0 over h, that's going to be f of h over h that we need to take care of. So we need to find the limit of this. So we, we say that f of h is less than c h squared. And our problem is to divide by h and also the absolute value. Uh, one, one thing we can say is that this is actually c h squared. Okay, the absolute value to the square is the same as without the square. But then this allows us to divide here by absolute value of h. Okay, of course, this for h different from 0. But because we are taking the limit as h goes to 0, we don't care about what happens at 0. And now we are in good shape because we take hn going to 0, hn different from 0, and we say that f of hn over hn is bigger than 0, of course, and smaller than chn. And this goes to 0, this goes to 0, so by the squeezing principle, this must go to 0 as well.
So we, we get not only that f is differentiable at 0, but also that f prime of 0 is 0. But uh, let's see, in the previous problem, uh, no, we, yes. the, the previous problem, we, we knew that it was differentiable. And we used that to show that it converged to f prime of 0. In this case, we want to prove that it's differentiable based on this inequality here. We say that because we have this inequality, we'll have differentiability at 0. Okay. So graphically, it's kind of interesting because it tells you that if you are able to put your function, if your function is under uh, the parabola, well, it's, it has to be uh, differentiable at zero at least. You don't look that excited about the result, but it, it's true for any function f. Okay. We are not assuming anything else. Questions? So are you having more difficulties with this material? Yes? More? So did you find the problems difficult? Yeah? Yes. Oh. But they only use the definition of differentiability, right? Yeah. And that's all you, you have to work with. I think it's all the manipulations. So it's just hard to see what you need to do. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so maybe we'll do more examples then. Okay. That would be helpful. Okay. So, yeah, last time we talked about. Uh, Operations on derivatives and also first applications of uh, uh, mean value theorems. Hmm. Yeah, so maybe we should do a few examples before we go on in 5.3, since you don't feel that comfortable with this stuff. Uh, okay. So more examples for 5.2. Um, let's do problem 10 to start things off. OK. So let, we define a function sinus of 1 over x. That's one of the favorite functions for counterexamples. Okay, it, uh, it does many uh, crazy stuff without uh, really being a very difficult function. So we, we are going to have a look at this. Uh, so the first question is, what's the limit of f of 1 over, is it 2n pi? 2n pi.
Uh, well, you compute the f of 2n pi, 1 over 2n pi, which is sinus of 2n pi, which is always 0. Right? Because you, you do whole circles. And therefore, this converges to 0. So the limit is 0 for this. Now, if we do 1 over 2n pi plus pi over 2, no, that's not what I want. OK. Um, then this is sinus, because it's sinus of 1 over x, I take this guy, and it's 2n pi plus pi over 2, which is sinus of pi over 2, which is 1. So again, it converges, it converges to 1. Now, the third question is, do we have a limit as x approaches 0? What would you say? Use A and B. No, why not? There are two different limits, OK? So let's check this. Let's call Xn the first sequence there. Is it true that this goes to 0? Because I'm looking for the limit at 0. So I need to be careful about we, uh, that my sequence actually goes to 0. Is this a true statement? Yes, because it's 1 over n times a constant, so it goes to 0. OK, and f of xn has a limit which is 0. Now, when we do yn, which is 1 over 2n pi plus pi over 2, does this also go to 0? Same thing, it's uh, smaller actually than this one and positive, so it must go to 0. And f of yn goes to 1. And the other important thing is to check that xn is always different from 0, and yn is always different from 0. Okay, so, that. so we do get that. We have two sequences, xn and yn, such that f of xn goes to 0, f of yn goes to 1. L, there is no limit for f. Because if it were a limit, every time I have a sequence going to 0, f of a sequence must go to the same limit. That's our definition. OK? Now, uh, if let's let's look at eleven. This time we define g to be x sinus 1 over x. For x different from 0. And g of 0 equal to 0. And
what bound do I have for sinus of 1 over x? 1. Okay, I don't care sine of what. Sine, the function sine, is always below 1. Okay, it can be anything in here. doesn't change that. Then we multiply by x on both sides, which is a positive quantity because I'm taking up some values. And this is what we get. So we get the g of x is less than x. Now, how am I going to show that g is a continuous function at 0? I'm sorry? Uh, OK, first thing, I need to take a sequence, right? Let's take xn going to 0. Uh, and it could be equal to 0 because we are looking at continuity. And it doesn't matter here. I, I mean, it, it can be equal to 0. And then we plug in here our xn. And then what do we do? This side goes to 0, and this side is positive. So this side goes to 0 as well. So again, by the squeezing principle, g of xn has a limit, which is 0. And that's equivalent to g of xn going to 0. <coughs> okay. So our conclusion is, and, and 0 is precisely g of 0. Okay, so it was a wide, uh, a wide thing to say g of 0 is 0. All right? And therefore, g is continuous at 0. So how come without the x, this is not a continuous function, and with the x, it becomes a continuous function? Well, if you try to graph this thing without the x, you get, you are always between minus 1 and 1, but uh, so this is sine of 1 over x. But as your x gets smaller and smaller, you are going to hit the, uh, the different periodic points more and more, and uh, it gets uh, very uh, chaotic around this. And it's not a continuous function. However, if you put an x, if you put an x, then what happens? Um, you have this. So this is the straight line, y equal x. This is straight line, y equal minus x. And then your function is bounded by x, as written there, so, so that it's going to hit this. It cannot go over the straight lines, and you force it to have fluctuations that are smaller and smaller near the 0. You have many, many fluctuations, but they are very small. And that's all you need to have continuity. So this is x sinus 1 over x. Now, the next problem is going to introduce x squared sine of 4 over x. Well, x squared has the advantage of flattening this thing even more. So it's going, to f it's going to fluctuate, but now you'll be squeezed between two parabolas. So it's going to be really flat near 0, and therefore it's going to be differential. Okay, that's, that's the idea. Um, now, comparing this result to the one you had to do for your homework, where you had a function which was less than a square, and you could show that you had 
uh, differentiability, it's interesting here to note that you don't have a square, you just have a power one, and you get continuity from that. But you don't get differentiability, which is stronger. If you get a square, then you get differentiability. Okay, but the idea is that these powers, the, the higher the power, the smoother the function. And therefore, the more derivative, higher derivatives you are going to get. <coughs> yes? Given the role of x in the definition of g, didn't we have to specify that x in n couldn't be 0? No, because it's, for continuity, you look at all the sequences that go to 0. You don't, you, you, in your definition, you don't have that x n must be different from 0. But in the definition of a limit, there you want to look at only the sequences that go to zero and are different from zero. That's the difference between the two. Okay? But if x sub n every became zero, then g is uh, It's zero. It's, yeah. Okay, is G differential at zero? Let's see. Well, we need to look at <coughs> G of zero plus H minus G of zero over H, which is G of H over H which is h sinus of 1 over h, over h, which is sinus of 1 over h. Now, by <coughs> the preceding problem, 10, we know that sinus of 1 over h has no limit as h goes to 0. So G is not differentiable at zero. So you see where the problem comes, why, why, why the power is an important thing. Uh, by, by doing this ratio, you lose your power one here, which was smoothing out things. And you are back to this uh, nasty function, which doesn't have a limit. Okay, that's, that's what the problem is. Now, what happens outside zero? Okay, so what happens to... <coughs> what happens to sinus of 1 over x when x is different from zero? Is this a continuous function, a differentiable function? And why? Continues first. What can I say about 1 over x as when x is different from 0? Can I say that this is a continuous function? Yeah, it's a continuous function. It's, it's a rational function. Wherever it's defined, it's going to be continuous. What about sinus of 1 over x when x is not 0? Is this still continuous? Why? Because sinus is continuous. I'm composing two continuous functions. Therefore, it's continuous. Okay. So we polarize ourselves at 0 because 0 is the only trouble point. Elsewhere, we're fine. Okay. So, so sinus of 1 over x is continuous at any a different from 0 by composition of continuous functions. And same thing, it's also differentiable everywhere except for 0 by composition of the differentiable functions. I can even compute my 
uh, derivative by using the chain rule. It's quite easy. Would that amuse you to compute it? Let's do it. <coughs> okay, you see it's well defined everywhere except at zero. <coughs> okay, so let's go on. We've 12. <coughs> so 12, we do things a little bit more general by defining k equal to x n sine 1 over x uh, and k of 0 equals 0. OK, let's, let's do maybe n equal 2. And then I'll let you do the general n. It's not more difficult. Oh, but then we cannot answer the questions. OK, so we need to keep the end. <coughs> OK, so uh, first thing, we want to show that if n is larger than 1, then k is continuous at 0. So we take a natural n. The problem with taking something which is not natural is that then you are introducing some more problems. Like you take, uh, I don't know, x to the 2 thirds or to the 3 half. Then if you take the derivative, uh, well, it depends what, what, how many derivatives you want to take. But anyway, uh, a power, this is a very regular function that will have as many derivatives as we want, which is not the case when you take a rational power or an irrational one. Anyway, so let's take n natural. And uh, let's redo exactly what we have been doing before. x n sinus 1 over x, well, let's first write this, is less than x. And then we multiply uh, less than 1, sorry. Then we multiply by x n both sides. And we get this. And so k of x is less than xn. Now we take xn going to 0, different from 0, and we write the same thing for xn. Hmm. Uh, it's not very good to have two ends running around. Let's call this thing uh, xj instead. And so we would get xj to the power n. Now, why can I say that absolute value of xj to the power n goes to 0? Com composition of absolute value and what other function? Yeah, it's the nth power. It's a polynomial. 
Okay, so this goes to zero because uh, any poly for any polynomial is continuous, and the limit of a polynomial is the value of a polynomial at the point you are taking the limit of. And then absolute value is a continuous function, so you get that the, this whole thing goes to zero. Same thing on this side where you just have a constant zero, and so you squeeze it and you end up saying, well, k of xj goes to 0 as j goes to infinity, which means then that k is continuous at 0. <coughs> what about the um, part A? Part A? Yeah. Oh. OK, we'll do part A now. OK. Mm -hmm. So this was B. So for part A, uh, yeah, you just have k of 0 plus h minus k of 0 over h. And the definition is uh, hn sinus 1 over h over h. The k of 0 disappears because it's a 0. And therefore, you end up with h n minus 1 uh, sinus 1 over h. So now you can put absolute values and get your inequality. And as always, you are going to get rid of the sinus of 1 over h by saying it's less than 1, and multiply by this guy, and you get the h n minus 1, which is what you want. Okay, so now we do C. Take HN going to 0, HN different from 0. Use the inequality that we just proved there, which is <coughs> that K of 0 plus HN minus K of 0 over HN is less than HN. Oh, again with my n, I want a j here. n is taken already. I cannot use n for this. OK, so we have hj going to 0. And this is less than hj to the power n minus 1. Now, if n is bigger than 2, or equal to 2, this goes to 0. If n is equal to 1, it doesn't, because I have a power 0. But if n is bigger than 2, this goes to 0. And on this side, it goes to 0 as well. So no, not only is k differentiable, but k prime of 0 is 0 can compute the, the derivative at k. So don't you feel better now with these examples? No. OK. Uh, but you should recognize that I'm always doing the same thing. OK, I write down my ratio, and then I have to evaluate it. And I have to find some type of bound. Use continuity, but I'm really manipulating definitions. That's all I'm doing. Okay. So 
you know, if you don't feel comfortable, just go back to these problems, the homework problems and these examples. Try to redo them without looking at my solutions. And then come see me if you have any question. Okay? There is a certain amount of repetition that you need to do here. And I cannot give you 100 examples because the examples get more and more involved. And um, you need to understand the simple, the simple examples first. Uh, there is no point in looking at more complicated stuff. But anyway, this, this function is an interesting function because you can, just by multiplying it, you see what happens and you, you get more and more properties out of it. You look exhausted. Soon I'll be teaching half an hour and uh, <laughs> we'll all get kicked out of this place and that's not good. So what should I do now? There is this beautiful proof that you haven't seen yet. Well, let's see it. Okay. That's the kind of attitude I like. <laughs> Well, at least it uses everything we know up to now. So, so what, uh, what we did last time about the mean value theorem was introduce a uh, state of the Cauchy mean value theorem, which I told you is a kind of flamma for you. It's not an important thing to memorize. And then using that, we prove the couple of consequences very easily. And those, are, in particular, the Lagrange mean, mean value theorem, that's really the mean value theorem you need to know. <laughs> so how one proves the Cauchy mean value theorem? So we are back to 5.3. And uh, so what does this say? Well, if f and g are continuous on a b closed and f and g are differentiable on a b open then there exists a c in a b open such that f prime of c times g of b minus g of a is equal to g prime of c times f of b minus f of a. So that's what we want to prove. We want to prove a, a generalized mean value theorem. Okay? As we noted last time, uh, what the, the, the mean value theorem says uh, is contained in this statement when you let g of x equal x. That's all you need to do. So how do we prove that? So let's define a function f as being something closely related to where we want to get, which is this formula, huh? and which is h of x equal to f of b minus f of a times g of x minus g of b minus g of a times f of x. Uh, one important thing is that if you do f h of a in this formula, you get what? f of b minus f of a. g of a. 
minus g of b minus g of a f of a. It's also h of b, yeah. OK? Because if you do h of b, you get f of b minus f of a times g of b minus g of b minus g of a times f of b. So let's see. So f of b, g of a. Do I have an f of b, g of a? I do. You see, we have minus here, minus here. I get this term here, which is the same as this term here. Then I need a minus f of a, g of a. Minus f of a, g of a. Hmm. Or does this disappear? Yeah, these two disappear. Oh, OK, I, I'm making things more complicated than they are. We can cancel this minus f of a, g of a, with this plus f of a, g of a, to end up with f of b, g of a, minus g of b, f of a. OK, this cancels with this. So we get this. And so let's do the same thing here. That would be, uh, so this time it's f of b and g of b, f of b, g of b cancels with f of b, g of b, and we are left with minus f of a, g of b, plus g of a, f of b. No, yeah, g of a, f of b. And this hopefully is the same as this. Yep. It is. Okay, so we do have that h of a is equal to h of b. So there are two possibilities now. Either h is a constant function, and all the values are the same as these two, or it's not. Okay, so first case, uh, h is constant. But we also know that h is differentiable. Why do we know that h is differentiable? How do we get g? Uh, how do we get h? We take a constant, we multiply by g. That's differentiable because g is differentiable. Minus another constant times f. Okay, we are just multiplying by constants and subtracting. Therefore, h is differentiable. Now, what can I say about uh, a differentiable function which is constant? What's its derivative equal to? Zero. zero. h prime is identically zero on a, b. Which means that for any c, The formula holds. Uh, OK, but I'm a little quick here. Uh, let's, let's compute uh, h prime of x first. So let's see. So h prime of x is very easy to compute because we have a constant times g minus a constant times f. So we say that this is f of b minus f of a times g prime of x minus g of b minus g of a times f prime of x. 
Now, uh, when we write that h prime of c is 0, and this is the case uh, for every c in AB, okay, because we are in the case where h is constant, what happens? Well, this guy is equal to this one, which is exactly what the formula says. Okay, we, we have a formula, a true formula. for any C in A, B. Uh, second case, H is not constant. If h is not constant, it means that h takes a value either below uh, the value taken for b and a or above. These are the two possibilities. So let's uh, take uh, a value below, for instance. Assume that there is x naught. such that h of x0 is less than h of a and h of b. Now, x0 cannot be equal to a or b because h of x0 is not equal to h of a or h of b. So x0 must belong to the open interval a, b. Now, uh, by the extreme value theorem, H attains its minimum and maximum on AB. Whatever hypothesis that I need to apply the extreme value term. Continuous on a closed and bounded interval. I have that, OK? Because f is continuous, g is continuous. Therefore, when I'm, I'm just doing a linear combination of f and g, I still get something which is continuous. So I can do that. Now, it attains its uh, minimum at a, at a point, let's call it uh, x1, c. So, assume so we see in AB such that H of C is less than H of X for all X. Now, the, the, the important point here is that C cannot be a boundary point. C cannot be A and cannot be B. Do you see why? The reason why is because H of C is less than H of the thing we call X0, which itself is strictly less than H of A, which is equal to H of B. So this tells me that h of c is strictly less than h of a and h of b, which tells me that c is not a and c is not b. Because what the extreme value theorem tells you is that your c is somewhere in a, b closed, not open. But here, because I have additional information, I know it's not in a or b. So what, why am I all excited about being open or closed at this late time of the day? Well, it's because then I can 
use the following property that if I'm in an open interval and I have a local extremum, what happens? What happens? The derivative is zero, and you are none. Okay, so so local extremum at C belonging to A B, which is open, because this doesn't work if it's not open, implies that H prime of C is zero, which as we did before, implies that formula holds for C. OK? So was it beautiful or not? I don't know about that. <laughs> OK. That's a polite response, at least. <laughs> so let's stop here for today.